uh, a short. It was a few seconds short, fairly short, short, if you would say. Uh, over 5,000 views and uh, a couple of supportive comments from the people who watch my content. But, you know, this when it hits over 2,000 views on a short, you start to hit a new audience who maybe hasn't heard of you before. And so here's the short. It's literally a few seconds. It takes me less than two hours a month to self-manage 16 units. So I don't set aside money to pay myself for everything back. It takes me less than two hours a month to self-manage 16 units. So I don't set aside money to pay myself for everything back. It takes me. That was it. Little, little somber music in the background, but just a clip of a longer video to say, this is what my content is about and what I normally talk about. All I said was it takes me less than two hours a month to manage my 16 rental units. Uh, and I did get quite a few responses from people who probably either have never owned rentals or have not educated themselves on owning rentals. And an example is uh, a friend of mine, uh, Michael Zuber, run rental at a time, has a property manager. And to manage his property manager takes him at least two hours a month, if not more. Uh, and part of that is because he has 187 rentals and just verifying that the payment was made takes up a lot of that time. So for me to do this in two hours uh, didn't start that way. Like most of the people who commented when I first started owning rentals, I was working full time. I was raising kids. I actually had a fairly busy life and I wanted to get rentals to escape the nine to five. I wanted to have that financial freedom and make work optional, which I did. It took 12 years to get to where I got to the point where I retired, walked away from my job last year, been retired almost a year now, coming up on the anniversary in 14 days, I think. So we're, we're down to two weeks away from being a year of financially free with rentals. And while I've been retired for a year, I'm still averaging less than two hours a month managing my rentals. I wanted to have it set up to take about two hours a month while I was working because I was working 50 to 60 hours a week, still had kids, still wanted to do other things. Um, so I wasn't investing to create another job. It's kind of entertaining when I see somebody that wants to clap back at landlords and say, it's not a job. Well, no kidding. It's not a job, but it invests to create a job. So congratulations. You uh, succeeded in your perception check. But when I first started with rentals, it took me, it felt like it took me 20 hours a week to manage one tenant. I had no systems in place. I did everything wrong. I thought I had to do everything myself. The only way to do this to save money was to do it myself. Um, it was challenging to work full time. I had a bit of a commute at the time and managed a tenant that seemed like he took all my time because I hadn't educated myself. I thought I was going to replace my W-2, which is when we're very first starting out with real estate is what we expect to do. It's actually a very different strategy that we end up using to reach financial freedom, retire early and make work optional. Um, but at the time that was my goal. So I was going to replace my W2 without any education whatsoever. I'm just going to jump into rentals because I knew a couple of people who owned rentals and I knew a, a realtor who was going to help me buy rentals and uh, had never invested the strategy that I was using or in the market that I was in. So I was doing everything backwards and wrong in the beginning. And without that education, I, I, I messed up that first year, basically wanted to quit. We tried to give the house away. Luckily, because of the 2008 housing crash, like most people in the United States, I was underwater on my house. Couldn't even use subject two to give the house away. Didn't even want to make any money, just wanted to walk away from it. Uh, so that luck of being underwater on my house is why I was able to reach financial freedom because I was stuck with that house. And I became the, the not accidental landlord, but the have to be a landlord. And I decided to educate myself. And if I didn't do that, and if I didn't start absorbing uh, financial independence con content, bigger pockets, one rental at a time, reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or listening to audiobooks on the subject, I would never hear simple phrases like, right, and I've heard this somewhere before, because I've said it dozens of times since I've heard it, and I've used this as a strategy. Treat your properties like you have a hundred, no matter how many you have, and treat your tenants like you only have one, no matter how many you have. And that meant for me, if I had a hundred properties, I wouldn't be the one going out to switch the ceiling fan. I wouldn't be the one going out to fix the deck or put in the screen door, right? I would have 
a system to make it easier. If I had over 100 properties, I probably wouldn't even want to be involved in the transaction of setting up the repair of the deck or the screen door. So I'll get to my systems in a minute on how I got my time that started out feeling like more than 20 hours a week to manage one tenant down to less than two hours a month to manage 16 rentals. And I'm now, I've just closed on a duplex, so I'm at 18 units now. That's going to be a house hack burr. So this is my first burr. Getting this one set up is going to skew the numbers on how much time it takes to manage a portfolio. But what I really want to do is uh, clear up the difference between managing and growing a portfolio. So when I talk about it, it takes me two hours a month to manage my portfolio. That does not include hunting for deals, running the numbers on deals, making offers on deals, uh, driving and learning neighborhoods, and any of the stuff that it takes to grow a portfolio. So what I'm categorizing as that two hours or less per month is the tasks that a property manager would do if I had one. Property manager is not going to hunt for my next deal. Property manager is not going to go learn neighborhoods for me. They're not going to make offers for me. So those tasks of growing the portfolio is not quantifiable, quantified in the two hours per month to manage, very careful on the verbiage here, of managing a rental portfolio of 16 units. I was in growth mode for over a decade, and it was a hobby. Uh, you call it an addiction, maybe. <laughs> But I really lo loved looking at deals. I loved getting the emails from my agents, right? I didn't do any off-market deals. All my deals are from the MLS. I've used conventional lending on every deal um, or my own money. And you know, so no creative financing, no wholesales involved, no short sales, no foreclosures, just simple, boring. And to me, boring is sexy because it made work optional and, uh, and, and let me retire decades before I probably would have been able to if I didn't invest in real estate. So the amount of time growing the portfolio in the beginning was massive. But it wouldn't be massive if the amount of time it took to manage the portfolio was also massive. I would have been as a lazy person, which is what I call myself. My actual course is called Financial Freedom for the Lazy Person. Uh, I would have been motivated to keep my portfolio really small if each rental took that 20 hours a week to manage a tenant like it was in the beginning or it felt like it was in the beginning. So I wanted to get my systems down to as little time from me as necessary so that I was motivated to grow the portfolio so that I could reach financial freedom. And to do that, I want to break down what the two hours a month is. I say about 30 minutes. It, it's very rarely 30 minutes, but about 30 minutes. It's usually way less than this. Is that good grammar? Much less than that. There you go. It's much less than 30 minutes a month is just to verify that I've been paid. Right? I have several different ways of receiving payments. So I, I have three goals when it comes to collecting rent from tenants. The first, I want to make it easy on the tenant. And, you, and you'll see why it's part of my systems. Second, I want to uh, <clears throat> leave a paper trail, even if it's just an electronic paper trail. And third, I want to save myself a trip to the bank. So there is an occasion every now and then where I have this one tenant who pays in cash that ends up sometimes costing me a trip to the bank. But the goal is those three things. So I accept rent payments in Venmo, Apple Pay, Cash App, Zell, uh, I have a tenant who writes six months worth of checks at a time, and I need to go pick that up from her, actually, uh, within a few weeks, apparently, within a week, it was a 10 days, to go pick up the next batch of checks. So I need to coordinate that. <clears throat> I have to verify that those are done. And I can give myself 30 minutes because sometimes depositing that one check, that lady that gives me the six checks at a time, with the app takes up to five minutes. So going in, logging into the different things, checking the balances, transferring out the balance, which I use the free versions where it might come two to three days later uh, so that I'm not paying a fee to collect that. And I've heard some people say, well, I wouldn't want to receive rent that way for two reasons. First, they say because the Venmo is going to report transactions over $600 to the IRS. My response, so should you. <laughs> you want to be, remain bankable and uh, get the next mortgage. You're going to want to report all of the rents that are coming in. And if you are like me and while you consider jail to be the ultimate house hack. It's not my retirement plan. So I don't plan on cheating on my taxes. So if Venmo reports it, great. They got the same information from two different sources. And the other thing is, if you receive payments uh, in certain ways, tenants can change their mind and take the money back. In almost every format, they can do that. You, uh, uh, Venmo, can they can change their mind. A check, you have 10 to 14 business days at your bank to go change your mind and get the money back. So you have a lease in place. If that ever happens, you're going to have to deal with small claims court, almost no matter how you receive the rent. So that's why tenant screening is very important. 
<clears throat> so that's the first 30 minutes of my two hours a month. Then I give myself somewhere between 30 minutes and an hour to deal with issues, right? And, and I'll have three or four months with no issues, no communication with tenants at all. Uh, maybe a lease renewal will pop up in that amount of time, but that is generally a couple of emails. You stand, I signed and scanned document back and forth. I don't do, your lease is done, here's the next year. I do a complete new lease at the end of every year with new dates and new information. Um, when the tenants print it out, uh, they initial each page. If your state requires that your, if your lease is more than 12 months long, so if you do a two-year lease, that it's a requirement that the tenant signature be notarized. Uh, so in some cases, a one-year lease is preferable. Uh, um, I've done several that were two years, but I used to have access to a notary that was free, so it's a little easier to do that. Um, so now I'll probably be going with one-year leases. But that is it. I've had in the last couple of months, I've had more water heaters break than I have in a decade. That's probably because they should have been replaced. I've talked about it in, pre in videos in the last year. I believe uh, I was scheduling repa repair and maintenance on these specific water heaters that went out. Uh, so I think I'm up to four water heaters and four refrigerators now, as I had another call yesterday on refrigerators. And so it's, oh no, you have a water heater going. That's terrible. How much time does that take? Maybe 15 minutes. Now it's aggregate, right? You receive the text. There's a problem. You get the pictures. Make sure the handyman's on board or your plumber or whoever you're contacting to get the information to them. So that's five to 10 minutes. And then there's five to 10 minutes to verify that the work was done and submit payment. It's not like I'm going to my properties when I have those issues. So even having those, that's your 30 minutes to an hour a month to deal with however many issues you're going to have. Now, the larger the portfolio, the more time this could take to deal with those issues. So you probably want to streamline the systems that I'm going to talk about for the probably hopefully 15 minute mark of this video. No, because I'm at 13 already. I'm trying to keep this brief. Um, so squirrel. Th that amount of time to handle issues <clears throat> depends on your systems that you get in place. Like when a tenant calls you and says the refrigerator has gone out, it is no longer working. It sends you a picture of their melted freezer stuff. You go on the Lowe's app, you put the address in, you choose select a refrigerator, you select Holloway old refrigerator. Five to 10 minutes, you've completely solved the problem that is sometimes plumbing or or a refrigerator or repair and maintenance, the reason why some people choose to work 50 to 60 hours a week instead of ever investing in real estate. So again, handling that issue. When you buy a property, one of the first things you want to do is build your list of emergencies. Google your area, go on Thumbtack, figure out in your area who provides 24 hours a day emergency plumbing service, water repair. Right? That's one of the biggest ones. Find out your electricians that work seven days a week. Might not have to be 24 hour a day electricity electrician service, but seven days a week service. Have that list pre-built. So when you get the text or the call or the email that says, here's the issue, there's very little stress. Make the email, make the text, make the call, handle the issue. Very abbreviated amount of time. The first time my handyman deal with a tenant, interact with a tenant, I'm kind of involved. I have been there sometimes to make introductions. A lot of times what I'll do is after a tenant has interacted with a handyman and I have gotten a positive report from both parties on how the interaction went, the handyman, uh, the tenant gets the handyman's contact info. And for most problems, they contact the handyman, not me. Handyman, and once you develop your relationships with the ones that work in your area and you know what level of trust you are, you might go 100, 200, I went 500. So anything up to $500, handyman can do the repair and then bill me. If it's over 500 or involves any kind of appliance, they're going to contact me because I might want to go and look and see what the best deal is currently available. So there are a lot of issues that handle that are handled between my tenants that never involve me. So if you are building a large portfolio and you have a property manager, your property manager is probably the most important person. So you need to screen and vet and make sure you get a good one, right? You date your agent, you date your lender, you marry the property. And to manage that property, that person that's going to work with you the longest time, you want to have the best relationship and level of trust with. As a person who self-manages their rentals, my most important people on my team are my handyman. So those are the people I build the relationships with that matter the most because that's where I get my time freedom from. I just spent a month and a half in Portugal. I had a water heater and a refrigerator and a garage um, door engine go out while I was there and it was texts and emails to handle it all. Still averaging less than two hours a month. Now, 
in order to keep this down, you have to think what takes the most time, what what strips you of your freedom as a landlord who is self-managing. It isn't the repairs because you're con you're dealing with contractors, handymen, you're getting quotes. Um, I use coded locks. So if I have a unit that's going to get a rehab, I don't even have to meet them there. They can do a FaceTime and walk through and I can talk what I want done. You can make this as simple or as complicated as you want. The thing that's going to take your time is tenant turnover. That takes your time. So if you have a lot of tenant turnover, that two hours a month is going to turn into five or 10 or 15 hours a month. So there's two strategies that I use to keep tenant turnover to a minimum. Uh, not because it saves money, because tenant turnover is expensive. That is an aspect of it, but sometimes the rent increase from a tenant turnover justifies the tenant turnover. The real reason why I use these two strategies to help limit tenant turnover is so that I have my time freedom. If we remove the first year of my investing, when I made all of those mistakes, and we take that tenant out of the equation, so for the last 11 years, I've had a total. Now, now that I'm up to, I had 16 rentals as of last week, this week I have 18 units, I've had four tenant turnovers ever. So if they took 10 or 15 or 20 hours, you average that out over 11 years, I still stay at the two hours a month or less for these four tenant turnovers. If I had a lot of tenant turnover, it might take a little bit more time. And I would probably get better at that system. If you want to get really good at that system, because Matt, the lumberjack landlord's portfolio is so large, he's streamlined that process. I would want to know how he did that. But my goal is to do these two strategies that help me limit tenant turnover. The first is when I'm shopping for the property. When I'm looking for the property that I'm buying, I look for aspects of the property that will help limit tenant turnover. And a lot of people will talk about things like, well, I don't want it next to a noisy club or under power lines or at an airport or someplace where the tenant's not going to want to live. That, that is true. Good thing to know. I look for things like side-by-side -side units. So I don't have tenants living above or below another. You have less noise complaints. I want at least two bedrooms in a garage because more space equals more stuff. More stuff means less likely to move. I want washer dryer hookups in each unit because tenants using shared laundry or laundromat are just waiting for the next place to open. I want good parking, especially on small multifamilies. I invest in uh, duplex, triplex, fourplex, uh, and I want enough parking for the tenants, not only for their vehicle, but if, if there's a couple living there or if they want to have somebody visit, there should be enough parking. That's my goal to all that. I don't think any of my properties check off every single box of my wants. This is a checklist of things I want. But if something's missing, I want more of the other things. An example is the duplex that I just closed on. It's my first over-under property. So it's missing my side-by-side -side goal, right? But it has a two, it's an over-under, it has two full wraparound decks that go to two-sided water views where the water is the, the length of a street away. So when 70, 80 feet, we're at the Puget Sound. So I think the water view for me compensates from the side to side units. Um, so you don't have to have every single one of those lists. That's the first thing I do is I look for properties that help limit tenant turnover, the aspects of the property. And the second thing is I use the binder strategy to set rents. I get the tenants to ask me to raise the rent. And if a tenant asks for you to raise the rent and you agree, and the tenant is happy, happy tenants don't trash your property and happy tenants don't leave. So those four tenant turnovers that I've had have been one passed away, one inherited a house. One, I helped purchase a house introduced to agent and lender and helped them get on the property ladder. And the fourth moved out of the area. So I've had four tenant turnovers that I've helped reduce the other tenant turnovers on the properties that I have by having those two strategies, selecting properties that help minimize tenant turnover and using the binder strategy on setting my rents, which you can find a completely free course on the binder strategy at deontalk.com. Uh, I'm keeping it free as long as I can. I am finding out that maintaining the website to enroll and maintaining the site for the course uh, is costing me about 400, 450 bucks a month just to maintain that. So I'm going to keep it free as long as I can. Uh, so I would get it before that changes. Uh, it's free. So it's not like I'm signing you up for a course there. That's just if you want to get your tenants to ask you to raise the rent, that is how I do it. And this, if you're watching in Futureland, is the end of the short video, which is a video from a longer clip of the conversation we are having today in Not Futureland, where I'm going to answer all of the questions in the comments. Uh, I'm going to figure out how to insert an outro when I cut these videos out to make those 
ones that you've been seeing if you watch my content on the weekends you're now seeing the intros to videos from like a year ago as I'm cycling through them every weekend one of those videos will come out so you get to see the intro because there are just people who will not click on a one or two hour length video howdy uh, so this is open format. Any questions are welcome. It can be about how I um, handle time management and keep my managing my rentals to a minimum so that I was motivated to get enough rentals to make work optional. My goal was not to get 50 or 100 or 137 or 187 rentals. My goal was to get the, the least amount of rental units to produce the right amount of cash flow. I used to say the least for the most, but it's not the most. It's the right. What I needed was at least four times my freedom number. My freedom number was the amount of money that it cost me to live my average life if I'm not living frugally. One of my big, biggest problems, and one of the things I agree the most with, with Ramit, I forget his safety, I forget his last name, but he has the new Netflix show. And he just did a really good interview with, uh, that Cody sent me with Mindy Jensen and her husband. On uh, It was really good. If you get a chance to watch the interview, I should put a link in the comments, so I'll pin a comment in the link below with the link to that video. Mindy is the host of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast. I've co-hosted with her a couple of times. Um, and I'm I've promoted her book on here and gave away a free audible copy. Right. So I have a lot of respect for Mindy because she's actually helped me some with some things. Some of the verbiage that she's helped me with was in the very beginning, I used to have a non-refendable pet deposit. And she explained to me that if you use the word deposit legally, that makes it refundable. And so it no, that technically null and voids the entire lease because it has to be a legal document and those two things can't exist. So fix that, fixed a couple of other things. Watch, watch her Bigger Pockets Money show because I, I like the guests that come on, share their strategies. I pick up tips to make my investing go better and my spending go better. Well, this interview with Mindy was really good because she runs the Bigger Pockets Money podcast. She does, uses a strategy called the live-in flip. So she buys a place that needs rehabbed. They live there. Their family lives there for at least two years while they do the rehab. And after two years, you can sell it. Use the IRS 121 rule. And since they're married, they can gain up to $500,000 in capital gains tax-free. Right. So I, I've, I've learned a lot from watching her. But this video was great because we talk often about you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You want to be an investor? Start talking to investors. You want to be a landlord? Start talking to landlords. Join local Facebook groups. Go to local meetups. Watch content and participate in the comments. Get to know the people like Millennial Mike and Lumberjack Landlord and Zuber and me and, and you know interact with us to, to grow the portfolio. But there's a caveat. My problem, and I agree with Ramin, I don't, I don't agree with hardly any of his, his investing advice. I think it's horrible, right? I have, <laughs> horrible enough to where I haven't memorized the parts I don't like to talk about it because that puts it in my memory. I just know that when I listen to it, I sit back and I go, oh, that's terrible. Try to blank your mind out of everything you just heard. But there's one thing I completely agree with him on. My problem with the FIRE community, financial independence retire early, is frugality. If I had to be frugal in retirement, I wouldn't have wasted my time. Right. I, I get it. If if you're 63 and you've never invested and you have a ton of bad debt and you want to retire, yeah, do everything you can to get the, the least amount of frugality necessary to survive in retirement. Hopefully you're not 63 and just now realizing how money works. But if you can retire early in your 30s, 40s, 50s, I retired at 52 last year. And you can figure out a way to do it to where you don't have to look at price tags and you can actually do things because you want to. And you don't have to care. I mean, don't, he doesn't say be frivolous and throw your money away, but Mindy and her spouse, I have a net worth of, they say it in the show, so, so I'm not revealing anything about her that I know. That's This is what we know from watching the episode. It's over $4 million, but they took a flight across the country from Denver to Florida that had two layovers to save $20 each. Right, that mentality, because we're around financially 
uh, motivated people who are trying to figure out how to increase your income, decrease your expenses, save and invest the difference, right? We That's like a mantra to, for those three things, right? When you retire, what I've struggled with for the last year is how do you spend money, right? I took a trip to Portugal. I was there for a month and a half. And while it wasn't expensive, it wasn't like the trips I took while I was on the financial freedom path where I went to Colombia or Thailand where the dollar is just extremely strong versus Portugal where it was, it was we were about 80%. So 80 cents of, you know, the dollar was worth 80% of a pound. So things seemed expensive to me. That might have been a contributing factor to me not liking it there. But if I had to live frugally here in the U.S. or when I travel, I'd probably still be working. That's something that we agree on. Bill? Howdy, Dividend Dave. He was so close to being first. Ninja Vanish. Howdy. Let's see if I'll skip down here. Wealth Building Journey. Howdy. Richard. Howdy. Rob. Dave, stop being early. You're messing with the time space continuum. Exactly. Josh. <laughs> with a dad joke. Thank you, Josh. And I will read, I'll read dad jokes if you put them in the comments, but I'd like the, comp the questions that come up later. Went to get a dozen bees and they threw in a 13th bee at no charge. When they asked why, they said it was a free bee. Or someone has sent that to my son later because he probably hates it. But I do send him dad jokes. Not the type of dad jokes you can share here. I have a, I have a joke one time. It was so horrible that a couple that I know broke up because he laughed. That's how bad jokes can be. And no, I'm not going to say that joke here. Uh, wealth building journey question about self-management. Does the time manage the rentals include verifying that all rent monies are in on time and that the principal interest tax and insurance expenses have also come out of the account? Yes. And it still takes less than 30 minutes. And part of that isn't because I've, I have this fear of rent not being paid or a bill not being paid. I automate as much as I can, right? So every payment going out is automated. County taxes here, they'll, I have, you know, the two paid off properties that I'm setting up. The first one that was paid off and the new one I just bought with cash. You contact the county and you say, so then April, they're going to take half the taxes and October, they're going to take half the taxes. Automated. I will check to make sure it happens, right? So even though it's automated, I, I do still verify. But the main reason I do go that first kind of week of the month uh, and watch is because it's it's still kind of fun to, to, to not, so like all of the work was done and the groundwork the establishment work to get this in place. But once it's in place, to watch a couple of rents come in, a mortgage go out, a couple of rents come in, a mortgage go out, a couple of you know, four, five, six more rents, and then another mortgage go out. It's kind of to make sure they're all happening. But mostly it's just at the end of the month, there's $17,000 in my account after all expenses and setting aside for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. That wasn't there at the beginning of the month. Um, if that happened for you right now, would you consider it work to check that it was happening? Let me know. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's work. But to me, it's like, there's a bunch of money that wasn't there yesterday. Oscar, howdy. Howdy, Jason. Frank, howdy. Sean, how's everybody doing? Jason, Laura, howdy. Lauren, good to see you guys here. Uh, Kevin, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. I'm I'm kind of glad that I got a bunch of comments on that short so that I knew that maybe it was something I should have covered a little more in depth. Uh, it, it really was just a clip from another video where I just kind of casually said, takes me about two hours. <clears throat> Adam Calhoun, howdy. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. Evening all. Always look forward to Tuesdays. Me too. Let me make sure that I'm not missing a question from Adam. There it is. Okay. Made an offer for my second property in Gary. Still waiting to hear back. Appreciate getting to meet you and Mike. It helped to restart my life. Saving the next down payment gets long and boring. It does, especially in the beginning. And I'm hoping, Adam, that you get the same problem that I do, where the money starts to pile up and you have to figure out where to put it instead of waiting for the next down payment. Jason, how long are your hot water tanks last? About 10 years. Okay, so moment of transparency. Started investing 11 or 12 years ago, right? Got that first duplex around 2013, 2012-ish. So we're coming up on we're saving for two years. So I, I count that as investing. Right? I was figuring out how to increase income with, with the side hustle, playing World of Warcraft, and selling stuff online. 
and uh, saving for the first duplex, tackling the what I call worst debt. There's three tiers to debt, right? Good debt, bad debt, worst debt. So good debt makes more money than it costs and somebody else pays it off. Bad debt uh, is for needs or wants, not needs, right? Credit card debt, uh, bigger car than you need, bigger house than you need. Worst debt is adjustable rate debt and uh, debt with a, a loan reevaluation period or high interest debt. So anything in my mind above 6% would be worse debt versus if you own a house and you have 3% interest, but it's your home and not an investment property. To me, that's still bad debt, but it's not worse debt because it's probably got a two or a 3% interest rate. It makes no sense to pay that off anytime sooner than putting your money to work in another investment. So my hot water tanks last for about 10 years. Uh, so I was giving you a moment of transparency. I started buying then. If it worked, I didn't fix it. Last year, I started to think, okay, I'm going to be proactive on maintenance and I'm going to replace water heaters. So I came up with these two numbers. Most of them had, uh, you know, a manufacturer's expiration date, basically. But I thought if it's in an interior enclosed area where the, if it the breaks, it's going to flood the floor of the structure. And most of my structures have crawl space uh, that can cause more damage. I was going to replace those at eight years. If it was in a garage or on a cement pad where a leak is not going to really damage the house as much, I was going to replace those at 12 years. Contacted my handyman, set up the, the so for the rest of this year, there was going to be go through cycle through all of the water heaters. Before we got to them, I'm at four now that have gone out this year. So I don't, I know one of them, I think the only one I know the date of was 2006. So whatever the math is on that, so 17 years. So yes, I'm going for eight and 12 years going forward, being proactive. Although I've had no damage to the structures and replacing the water heaters that were bad or just having them cycled through cost me exactly the same. So being proactive wouldn't have saved me anything. Uh, I still recommend doing it though. And I'm going to do it with the rest of the portfolio. Angel R. Howdy. My tenant's paying $11.75, offers a year's rent up front for a discount. Lease is ending. I plan a $25 increase. What should I do? Would you accept a year's full rent up front and not increase? Uh, so how does your rent compare to area average rents? That to me it determines what I do with the rents. If it's a little more and you're and, and, and Try not to listen when people who've never owned a rental say, well, if your expenses haven't gone up, don't raise the rent because that's not how this works. Your taxes, your insurance, your cost of labor, your cost of materials, expenses that you're not seeing every month are going up. So a rent increase is justified. I don't like to take a year's payment up front. I've been offered it a few times. I've refused it because what happens if the tenant moves at five months, but you've spent the money, right? That rent is paid per month, even though you took it all at once. Now you've got to come up with their rent back, their deposit back. Uh, not something that I want to have to mentally tabulate that yep, I have this much income for the year. Mathematically, if you get the money up front, you get a 4% savings rate. It's going to make more sense to put the money in there. Maybe beat the discount. I don't like it. I want my tenants to pay their rent monthly. Uh, I will schedule different times of the month, depending on how they're paid. I have a person who's paid every 30 days and their rent is due on the 8th. So it starts on the 8th instead of the 1st. Right, so I can be flexible with tenants. I would not offer the discount if they offered to pay them the year up front. Uh, uh, some of the things that I've heard is uh, people call it a red flag, right? What's the reasoning for the paying it up front? They have money now, they're terrible with money. So in a year, they're not going to have it. Or they got a one-time windfall and they're bad with money. An example is the people who, Matt the Lumberjack Landlord, did the uh, ERAP, Emergency Rental Assistance Program, where they paid the rent in a, a little bit higher amount, but for a, a period of time, and when it canceled, almost every, almost every one of those tenants had to go through some form of an eviction problem because the money coming from another source doesn't mean that that is a good person with money. Now, there are some people who just say, I want to pay the rent, I want to get it done with, and it makes sense to them. Still not worth a discount to me. It, I don't know that it's worth extra to get the money all at once for me. Uh, so if you're looking at they're paying 1175, if every average is 1200, maybe leave it the same. 
Hey, you don't want it up front. If very average is 14 or 1500, I would bind your strategy, right? And get the rent to where I want. If you're planning on a $25 increase, uh, look at the binder strategy and see if maybe having that conversation with the tenant and explaining, you know, these are this is what the tenants, the rentals around here are going for. This is where your rent is. This is what, you know, and then I use the binder strategy. Uh, hey, for props. So you have a binder strategy where it talks about what your current Redfin Zillow estimate is of your property. And you can actually point to the tenant and say, here's what my property taxes and insurance are going to be based on. Reference a couple of the stories with insurance companies pulling out of California. And insurance rates doubling or going up 80%. It's the quick Google search will show you several stories of that. So your expenses are going up. And that to me would justify doing the binder strategy, unless you look at your area average rents and they're less. Then the tenant should bind your strategy you and get you to lower your rent. So good question, but a year up front wouldn't impact my desire to give a discount area average rents, set rents, not what someone paid for rent last year, not what your expenses are. Your expenses don't matter to a ton. So I have a paid off property and I just purchased a property all cash. I'm going to have a tenant in the other unit and I have tenants in properties that have mortgages. Do you think having a mortgage on the property or having a paid off property changes the rent amount that the tenant's going to pay? Our expenses don't actually matter to the tenant. The reason I say to point out things like that is because it shows you a level of transparency with information that the tenant can then go verify, which adds validity to everything else that you're saying. Rob, howdy. When's the next members live? This weekend. We want to see your new market. I don't suppose that's where Mike is putting an Airbnb. No, I, I believe Mike is doing the other half of his duplex where he currently lives which is in Washington state, not in Seattle, not in King County, but fairly close, not in the same market that I'm at. Um, but the next members live should be this Saturday. This Saturday, I have the course. And according to the Google calendar, this is probably the last Saturday for the course Zoom calls, but I'm probably gonna do another one and I'll schedule it or two or three, I'm addicted um, to trying to help. And it's really cool getting in there with a the more one-on-one -on -one aspect of getting into people's portfolios. but. Uh, this weekend starts the Bigger Pockets bootcamp where I'm the teaching assistant. So that'll be Saturdays. And I think the 24th and 26th are my first two for them. But this Saturday around there. So probably I'll have to check my schedule. I'll put it, uh, I'll probably put the video up later today to say when it's coming out Saturday to get literally give four or five days for people to hopefully get noticed because YouTube's notice thing sucks. Kevin, howdy. I'm looking to do a room rental house hack. I found a great house with a ton of potential. It is in a B neighborhood, but near the border of a D neighborhood. After walking the area, it feels like it is on the border. Nice when you walk in one direction, a little sketchy as you walk in the other direction. What should I think about before making an offer? So if you're investing in an area, um. It's good to walk the neighborhood, but I'm hoping you're putting a little more time and research into knowing which markets to avoid and which ones you want to invest in. Because B to D is a pretty big gap, but they can be close together. Um, if you're studying the market, what which way is it trending? Is there construction going on, new builds, new um, restaurants, new stores going in, or is it an area where stores are closing and leaving the area? Right, right. That can take a bit of time to figure out. Uh, if you're putting in the, the mark, so when you're figuring out your rent, remember tenants don't really think the way an owner does. Tenants don't think class D, C, B, or A, right? They think area. In this area, when I look on Zillow or Redfin or Trulia or apartments.com, what rents do I see? What is the area average rent? And if you're right on the border of a good area and a bad area, tenants are going to see the right across the street or two, three states down, rents are significantly less. So I would probably try to figure out a closer to the low end balance on the rents to figure out, will I get the return I'm looking for? And if you're looking at a house as a house hack potential by the room, uh, I take this from Todd Baldwin, who does that strategy, and the number of bathrooms is, to me, as important as the number of bedrooms would be. The closer you can get that balance, the less shared bathrooms you're going to have, the less tenant turnover, the more you'll be able to charge per room. So I'd be looking at aspects like that. I would probably check out. I don't know if he's making YouTube videos anymore because 
uh, YouTube shadow banned him because he made a couple of political statements, um, probably ones I agree with. So I'm not going to make them because I don't want to be shadow banned yet. But someday when I'm ready to be shadow banned, <laughs> but not today. I would look at those things and I would go watch Todd's old content from a year or two ago where he talks about the strategies he uses, how he limits tenant turnovers, how he gets his rent story, wants them, what he's looking for on a property that he buys. He's probably got the best information on buy the room strategies. John L, how y'all doing? Thanks for all you do. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Dan, Dan, do you have direct access to the MLS? Nope, not like so. Also is the only way to get access from a realtor. Yes. So I have a long list of reasons why I'm not a realtor. Uh, and Redfin, Zillow, all of the ways to look at properties in some areas, it might be okay for single family house, but in almost every market that I've looked, it's terrible for small multifamily. The properties that I've purchased generally showed up after they closed, or if you're, if you're looking for properties that have been on the market more than two months, you might finally see them on Redfin or Zillow. But if you are in a situation where you want to make offers fast, I would have, um, I don't have access to the MLS. I have several, at least three, so usually more agents with auto searches set up. Whichever agent sends you a property first is the one that gets the deal. Uh, and to, to do that, it does take several searches because it's kind of nuanced. When you when you when I take the same copy and paste email and I send it to different realtors, they send me different deals. Uh, and now, I, yes, if it's been on the market 20, 30, 40 days, I start to see the same deals from different agents. But who sent it first? And it's not always the same one. So that's a good question. Uh, even if I became a realtor and had access to the MLS, I would have other agents with auto searches set up because searching seems nuanced. Jason, will the binder remain free to course members? Yes, if you're in the course, you'll always have the binder strategy for free. So if that ever does change, if you're in the, the regular course, then the binder will still still be free. That is a good question. I'm going to take a note to make sure that I actually start. And I dropped something. Of course. So right now in the binder course, which you can get for free, and I'm trying to leave it that way, uh, you can get the, the different ways to use the binder strategy. So section A, property manager, at a distance, through text, through email, in person, when to use the binder strategy. So after closing on a property about two months later, or when there's been a black swan event, I mean, I, I go into detail on in explaining all of the different times you should use the binder. Um, but you also get my expense spreadsheet and income and expenses that I use that, that me and my CPA put together uh, for free. And you get my seller financing letter for free. So that's all in the free binder course. The stuff in the course, it's... Uh, and I'll be transparent. Everything that's in my paid course is here on YouTube in about 5,000 hours worth of content. So what the course is for is to filter it down to just what works chronologically to reach financial freedom if you're super lazy like me and you want systems that help you keep it down to two hours a month, uh, all filtered into one specific place. Plus we'll do the, I'm probably going to do this at least four times a year where we have a full month of every Saturday we have a live zoom call where it's it's not quite one-on-one -on -one. there's usually five to ten people in there that we dig deep into the portfolios and my chat moved which i appreciate because that means there's questions coming uh wealth building journey ramit sethi thank you i will teach you to be rich right so great interviewer i think his questions are great because he, he posits a question in his, in his response. And it's really hard to do that as an interviewer. So I like that. I liked this interview with Mindy because we agree on the problem of frugality. It's my biggest problem with the this. It's in the top two problems I have with the FIRE community. First, three. Jeez, I don't like this community. The first problem, in these top three in no specific order because it takes too much brain power. And I'm way too lazy. First of these three, in any random order, you have to be frugal. Second, they're mostly stock people. And I wouldn't own stocks if they came with free tacos. Third, they rely heavily on retirement accounts. Now, if someone explain to me, feel free. What is the point of the retirement account if you plan on retiring early? That's it. So it's not FI community, it's FIRE, financial independence, retire early. 
that completely negates and removes the, the need and point of retirement accounts. Yes, we contribute for the match before somebody throws that in my face. I hated doing that. I, I couldn't wait till this year when I don't have a W-2 to just take the money out, pay the 10% penalty, take that money and put it to work where it actually gets a return. Anna, howdy, do 5% conventional loans require PMI? Mine did. There are some companies that will do 10% that don't require PMI, but at 5%, I did have PMI. I rec recommend going conventional, not FHA. A couple of reasons, conventional. PMI drops off when your equity hits 22%, and you don't have to refinance out of it to repeat a conventional owner-occupied loan. Art T, howdy. What was the LV, LVP flooring website that Lumberjack uses? If anyone knows, somebody will probably have to link that. I don't have it memorized because I use Floor Trader of Tacoma for my LVP purposes. And I'm not an affiliate or sponsored, but I should be. I don't think they'll ever watch this content, but here's the funny thing with that store. I started going there when the dad owned the store and the son was probably around 30 and he looked like a 30 year old and the, the dad retired or health concerns or whatever happened. So the dad steps back and the son took over. And in the last 10 years, the 30 year old now looks 60 running a store like that's got to be challenging. He should look at retiring early. Uh, Art T, Emma, yes, they do, okay? Anything under 20%, it's on a sliding scale. The more you put down, the less it is. I'm in a contract right now putting 15% down and PMI is $18 a month versus if I was going to be 392, yes. And the 10%, I forget which lender that was that talked about 10% with no PMI, but it was somebody I heard on Zuber's channel. So it's it's either Convoy Home Loans, Velocity Mortgage, one of those. But if you, anytime you're looking for loan products, one of the reasons we shop around is not just because of interest rate. Rates, terms, the mortgage insurance, all of those other things that can be different lender to lender. Joshua, howdy. Finally got an accepted offer on a house hack duplex. Been looking since October 2021. Three amigos have kept me motivated. Now the journey begins. We'll be using the binder on the remaining tenant. Awesome. You have to let me know how that goes, Josh. And I know another Josh who's under contract on his first house hack as well. Rob, waiting sucks. Agreed. It sucks when we're starting. Larry, howdy. Love your content. Thank you. I'm at six doors in 11 months. Congratulations. Need to slow down to make the wife happy to fix my own home first. <laughs> so one of the things is uh, you never want to ride in the mechanic's car. right? They might be great at fixing other people's car, but their car is usually bungee corded together because the mechanic knows it just needs to work. As an investor, one of the things uh, that's rough is uh, I want to fix the tenant stuff first before I fix anything where I'm at. Uh, but the stuff where you live needs fixed too. Uh, financial firefighter Mark and Marcus Shiro in Hawaii kind of had the same thing. He cashed out all of his retirement account and acquired like 14 rentals in less than two years. But then he had some tenant turnover, some evictions and some stabilizing to do. So if you got six and 11 months, it might be not just to fix the stuff at your house, stabilize the portfolio, make sure the relationships with the tenants are good, fix and maintain the things that help keep tenants. So for me, slow is boring and boring is sexy. Anna, thanks Art. I didn't even know 15% was an option. Is that conventional owner occupied? Yep. You, it's, you can find lenders that will let you do anything all the way up to paying for the whole thing. Wealth building journey. From a mini OCD perspective, I'd consider it work to check the rents, maybe for the first six months. I don't know. You're looking at those numbers. You're saying, oh, I hope it's paid. So there could be the stress of the tenant. If your tenant's due on the first, landlords think, oh, they're going to pay the rent on the first. No, that means whatever your grace period is in your area, if it's three days or five days, they're going to pay on the third or the fifth. That's just generally how that goes. So you have three to five days of sitting back and wondering, oh, am I going to have my first eviction or my next eviction? So there is a little bit of stress there. But when the rent goes in, and you, your brain realizes that's your money that you didn't clock in to get that you could do whatever you want with. That kind of gets rid of the, the stress of doing that. Shankar, howdy. 
And have all your rentals been from MLS? And what is the ROI did you target? That's a great question. Uh, so when when you're looking at your ROI, it's market dependent and asset class dependent. So you want to look in your area. Uh, and, and Zuber from one rental at a time recommends 60 to 90 days. I think that's a good time frame to learn what is normal. Once you learn what is normal. So if your area returns a negative 3% interest rate or not negative 3% cash on cash return, maybe that's the wrong asset class for that market. Or you have to think about value add or grow your market or something, right? If it's two or three percent, and you can find four or five percent, then that's a good deal. If your average is five to seven percent, you can find eight or nine. So you're trying to beat what's normal in your area. And for a long time, the three amigos would say, you know, from Zuber's class, one rental at a time, we would say, learn average and then beat it. Always go for the great deal. Matthew Lumberjack Landlord pointed out that really it's not so much to get a great deal, but learning average and then beating that protects you from getting a bad deal. And that made a lot of sense when I heard him say that. So in my area for several years, I was able to find seven and 8%. So I shot for 10. So my worst deal so far first year was like 10.00001. It was really close to a 10% deal. Most average about 12 to 14. Uh, my best was 17. But that's year one. By year three, almost all of them are above 20%. Rents go up. Binder strategy is effective. Mortgages basically stay the same. Even last year when my insurance rates went up 80%, 80%. That means instead of $400 a year, it cost me 700 and something dollars a year. Spread out over 12 months. When I have a tenant ask for a $450 rent increase and the insurance goes up less than $100 a month, it becomes a much better return. So learn average, try to beat average. And then remember that that's year one. Uh, so I did the math on this new purchase and I have it written because I'm going to make a video on it. Uh, top of my head, it was a little over 12% return if I used a mortgage, which I didn't, and did a 20% down at the current interest rates. Uh, it was about 8.9% return as an all cash purchase, which is what I did. Um, and I, but I took the house sack out. I did it as if both units were rented at a little below what I consider to be area average rents in this in this market. So that's what I'm still shooting for. And to answer a question that is not asked there, Shankar, let's say you can only get a 5% return on your rental, but you can get 10% return in stocks. So you have the magic crystal ball. You actually know which stock is going to get you 10% return next year. I'd still get the rental at 5%. Hear me out. The 10% return in stocks is then going to be taxed. And it is only realized if you sell portions of the stock. So you, you lose the stock that is the gain to get the money that is the gain. The 5% is a cash on cash return in cash flow. You're actually getting that money because of depreciation and write-offs. You're actually not paying any taxes on this. But on average, real estate appreciates 5% per year. Now we have some years like the last ones where we had 19 and 24%, but I'm going to go, you know, benefit of the doubt, only 5%. You put $100,000 into a rental or $100,000 into stocks. The 10% return on the stocks gives you $10,000, which is then taxed. The 5% return when you put the 100,000 into the rental gives you $5,000, but in cash without having to sell anything that is not taxed. Then since you put $100,000 into a property and you have a $400,000 mortgage because you did 25% down, that 5% appreciation of $400,000 is 20 grand. So the 10% gain in stocks is doubled by the $20,000 gain in, in real estate, plus the tenant is paying off a portion of the loan, plus you had the 5,000 in cash flow that is not taxed. And you're actually probably carrying forward a loss with depreciation into the next year for your gains. So even if you could get double the return in stocks, I'd go for real estate. Uh, wealth building journey, my chat moved. I need to talk to some more lenders about loan products. Should I mention that I'm specifically looking for investor loan products or simply say, what kinds of loan products do you have available? I'd probably ask what kind of loan products do you have available and then stress that you are an investor and you're going to be doing more business in the future because a lender's job is to sell loan products. Doesn't mean it's the best one for you. So you, you also want to clarify with what you're doing and you want to 
mention that you're going to be new, doing more loans in the future and that you're going to shop around. I let the lenders know that. And, and I've had one lender one time so far say, well, if you're going to shop around, I'm not going to waste my time with you. Oh, so you're not proud of your product and you know I'm going to beat it. So thanks for saving me the time. And then I move on to the next lender. Shankar, follow-up question. Has your criteria changed for your next acquisition for current market? Criteria was pretty much the same. I have the same list of things I want, but I'm not going to get 100% of them. I'm going to try to fit like 80 to 90% of what I'm looking for. What changed, and, and so there was a shift in the last couple of years. So if we go back a year, for three years, so 2020, 2021, early 2022, speed was our friend. So not so much that the criteria changed. I was looking for the same return then as I am now. So my criteria on uh, ROI hasn't changed. I've considered maybe lowering it as, as I couldn't find a deal for a long time, but there was a couple of other strategies that I wanted to do first. An example on that is a lot of people talk about, well, rents are going to go down. Well, before you lower the rent, offer a concession, half a month free or a month with no rent to get a tenant in at the right amount so that next year their rents are already at the right amount. So a small increase gets you where you want to be. So like instead of doing what you want to do, you find a way to get what you want instead of doing the, the thing that can have a negative impact. Instead of lowering my ROI expected, the the next year, so 2021 was my last purchase. Speed mattered. You had to get your offer in fast. After that, what I started doing is watching days on market. As the days on market piled up, there's there, the seller is more likely to take a lower offer because interest rates started going up. Prices haven't come down. So you had to find a way to find a motivated seller that would take less than market would be. I I looked. For a year in my market. And I found a couple that would make sense. Um, I made some offers. I had some offers come really close. I backed out of one because it was there was way there was much more work than I was expecting when I got to the inspection phase and I didn't pay for an inspection. I went to the property and looked. I had a friend who owns a septic company. We went to the county, looked up the records, found out the water level was rising above septic, so just about to hit foundation. A bunch of reasons why I backed out. So I was still was doing the work, I was still studying. I, I was considering buying in another country. So I kind of put buying here as a less uh, you know, back burner kind of thing, more on the back burner. I looked in Portugal, decided I don't like the people, so I'm not buying there. And I know it seems rough to say that, but I've explained it 50 times as to why it wasn't just that the, the people there sucked. Can I make that joke? I hate racists and Portuguese. Is that racist? <laughs> yeah, I can't make the joke. Too soon. So I'm not going to buy in Portugal. I came back, and what I did is I shifted my market. So I generally was, was you know, in, in the UK, they measure distance in kilometers. And in the US, we measure distance in time, right? So I was going an hour from where I would live. I went all my rentals within an hour, but usually more than 10 miles apart. And I wasn't finding any in the two counties I normally do. So I took my own advice and I expanded that circle out, right? So full circle and cut out everything above me because that's King County and nobody should invest there. Uh, so but that opened up two new counties, uh, Kitsap County and Mason County, where more remote workers are moving to because you're going to hear a lot of remote working is ending. You're going to hear people like I heard it on Minority Mindset saying, well, a lot of the companies are requiring you to come back to the office. And that's and you're going to see that because it's the tech industries that are requiring people to come back in the office. It's not. And that's still less than 12% of the workforce. So I'm going to take a poll. I'm probably going to actually do a poll on YouTube. I've, I've kind of done the math on everyone that I know in my area, everyone that I've actually interacted with. Now, I'm going to take out truck drivers because that's a skewed, biased opinion because I ran a truck driving school for 13 years. So I know a lot of truck drivers, but I'm going to take them out. It's kind of hard to do remote truck driving. 50% of everyone that I know works remotely. So if, if Google and uh, Facebook and Tesla and whoever requires people to come back to the office, that's not a very big amount. There's still a lot of people who are working more remotely, especially in green states. There, there are tax incentives for businesses that don't force people to commute. There's uh, all kinds of things that are forcing, not forcing, allowing remote work to happen. So people are going into the office once or twice a week instead of five days a week. So they've expanded out how far they will live. Prices haven't adjusted. So I found two markets where the prices were still not good at two years ago rents, but good deals, 10% return. I found several. I made offers. I got one accepted and the seller blew the deal up by re-signing year-long leases at significantly low rents. Can't control what the seller does. But I found that my property that I'm moving into 
And everyone in the area, every investor in the area, can't believe I got it because it was originally listed at 500. They dropped to 477. And there were several people I've talked to that said they thought about doing a 450 offer. So they were going to offer 450. They thought of it. They were on the cusp. I offered four. Sat on the market a long time in a new area where I now know what the rents are. I took the time to learn the market, the area, the brands. I did a rent box study. It made sense at 450. And I paid four. So... That's how I expanded my market to find a market that had worked because of what remote working has done to the market in my area. Hi, Michelle. Howdy. Kind of why I think I like what um, Millennial Mike is doing investing in Gary, Indiana, because it's 45 minutes from Chicago. It's the third largest city in the country. And with more remote remote work being an option, I think there's going to be more demand in his area. And the wealth building journey took back a message to make me lose sleep and wonder forever and ever what that was. Ninja Vanish, I will be back later to watch. Thank you. Jason. Uh, Adam Collin, did you use Olson Group by chance? I am thinking of investing in Gary. I am in Chicago. Do me a favor. If anybody knows the Olson Group, Tell them to check their emails. I have a couple of people now that have reached out to them and aren't getting a response. They seemed pretty squared away when I met them. But if they're not answering emails, when you're saying I would like to be a buyer, they need to fix that problem. Dave, I saved over $5,000 by switching to Geico. You mean another floor guy, as you took Matt's advice and got several quotes. Rob, so when Mike finally stops being lazy and finishes his course, are you going to narrate it on Audible? If he does a book, sure. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm, try- I'm trying so hard to get this book narrated for Zuber. Um, then Audible kicked it back. I've got three chapters to fix, and there's only like seven chapters in the book. So um, that book should be coming up soon. Julie Anderson, American Flooring Corporation. And I think you mentioned Lumberjack Landlord to get on their radar. Michelle, I need to go through my insurances to see what I can save. Are you serious, Dave? He did save five thousand by because he had a quote for nine thousand and something, and he got a new another quote for four thousand and something. I saw this in the Lumberjacks live on Sunday. Good old times. Howdy. What is your process and things that are required to turn a primary residence into a rental? <clears throat> so my process uh, when I did that was all wrong because it was my very first property that I turned into a rental. I lived in my property. I found out about $89,000 in bad debt in my name that I didn't know until the divorce. I was a single parent with three kids and I was making $17 an hour because I got laid off from law enforcement, started teaching people how to drive trucks. So that's the position I was in. I had a bad debt to income ratio, bunch of bad debt and low income. So I moved from my house into an apartment and rented out the house. Pretty simple transition. I was uneducated. I didn't listen to any podcasts, any audiobooks. I didn't educate myself. I didn't know about bigger pockets. I didn't know about one rental at a time. I hadn't taken any time to learn anything. And I thought, I can't trust a stranger. So I'm going to rent to a friend. Friends don't need a lease. I'm just going to handshake. Oh, he's a single parent. I'll understand if his rent's late because I've had that struggle too. Late became never. Trashed the property. When I finally went to the house to talk to him and say, hey, what's going on? Why haven't you paid the rent? He didn't live there. He had moved out, rented the house to someone else and was collecting rent and keeping it. Like So my one example of my process of turning my primary residence into a rental is a great example of all the stuff not to do. So since then, I've educated myself. Your primary residence, one of the first things you do if you buy another place and you want to move out and turn that one into a rental, is contact your insurance because most people don't understand this. Your insurance will go down four or $500 a, a year when you don't live there. Insurance companies will try to tell you, oh, you need landlord insurance. I don't have landlord insurance. I have homeowner's insurance. So the requirement for homeowner's insurance for me is $300,000 injury. So a slip fall that's covered up to $300,000. Full replacement value of the property, not just the amount of the mortgage. I want the house replaced or the duplex or fourplex replaced. So I pay a little bit more in insurance for that, whether I live there or not. And then I have an umbrella, $2 million policy. So if something goes above the $300,000 threshold in the property, then the, the umbrella policy kicks in. While you live there, they insure your personal items, TVs, computers, clothes, furniture, all that stuff. 
that costs just about as much as the insurance for your property for the year. So when I moved out of my duplex, my insurance went down by almost 50%. When I'm moving out of the fourplex, my insurance is going down about $400. So it's like 900 now from 13. It was my most expensive one. And I'm moving into the, the new duplex where I don't even have a mortgage. I'm still getting homeowner's insurance, same amount, but I'm going to do it owner occupied. So the insurance costs a little bit more. So when you move out and you contact your insurance to say, I no longer live there. I no longer want to insure personal items. Landlord insurance is something that will cover rent. If for some reason you're not collecting rent, it doesn't cover if your tenants just say, screw off, I'm not paying you rent. It's covered if there's some kind of natural disaster that makes it to where the people can't pay their rent. Even the pandemic didn't count for landlord insurance. So I don't have that. That's stupid. Um, if we have an event going on so bad that FEMA is here, paying your mortgage is going to be the last of your worries, and you're probably going to go on to forbearance anyway. <clears throat> so when you move out, uh, you want to put in place uh, landlord policies for utilities. So while it's vacant and you have handyman or contractors going in and fixing and upgrading anything that you need to do, uh, make sure everything is functional, safe, and clean for the tenants, you want there to be power and water. So it goes into your name. As soon as a tenant moves in, it goes into their name. And if the tenant ever moves out, it goes back into your name so that your handyman and contractors will have power to go and fix anything that they need to. So it's called landlord policy with utilities. You want to find a good lease. Uh, and so Bigger Pockets Pro, if you have their pro membership, you get a lease made by an attorney for every state. Um, Apartments.com, Zillow, a couple of the other platforms give out a free lease. What I would do with that lease is take it to an attorney that lives in your area, works in your district where you're investing, and ask them, if I was going to retain you to be my attorney, which is what I did, I gave $1,500 to an attorney, so they're on retainer if I ever need to evict somebody. Is there any verbiage that you would want in this lease to make your job easier if we go to court here? Because that attorney knows your court system. And, and this is something I got from my brother. Uh, he's had rentals for a while. He's retired with 10 paid off rentals. And he did this, went to the attorney, asked for verbiage for his thing. So I did the same thing. They added a paragraph and a half, put that in my lease. Uh, so have a strong lease, know your local laws, and really research your local laws. A lot of people will say things like, I live in California, so we have rent control, which is actually not true. If you live in California and it is a single family house or a duplex, in your name, not in an LLC, land is not rent control. Put it in an LLC, now it's rent control. Uh, larger than duplex, rent control. If you're in Oregon and you are occupying one of the units of a small multifamily, that is not rent controlled. So you need to know your local laws on, on that type of stuff. Build a list of your emergency numbers. So plumbers, electricians, plumber, I want 24 hour a day emergency service, at least three numbers that I can call in case they're busy or they don't answer or they go out of business. I want to have no stress when I have a 10 o'clock call or handyman calls and says, this is what's going on. I just go to the numbers I already have saved, give them a call. I want seven day a week electrician service. Doesn't have to be 24 hours a day, but I want seven day a week emergency service. Uh, so maybe they only have certain hours of the day, but they can be out there the next day if the problem is on a Friday night. They can be out there Saturday. Um, develop relationships with handymen. Try not to do everything yourself. Uh, that If you do everything yourself, it doesn't hurt to work. I worked next to the handyman in the first couple of projects to get a scope of that amount of time so I knew what was a fair price. But the more you do yourself, the less likely you're going to be motivated to add more units. And you want to be motivated to add more units. So for me, that was developing relationships with handymen. Good way to find handymen. Just to go on Thumbtack, it's actually what I'm doing in this new area where I have this new duplex. I'm going on the thumb, Thumbtack and I'm hiring people for some simple things. One is a window installation. One is going to be just, I hate my brain. So like three simple things, a couple different handymen coming, gives me a chance to interact with them, hire them for a small thing, see what their response time is like, their communication skills are like, see if what I feel about their estimates. And then I'm going to say, what else can you do? Right, The last handyman that I built a relationship with came and replaced a garage door engine. During the conversation, I get this list of all these other things that they're skilled at, licensed and insured to do. So I have a handyman that has a sub electrician and a sub plumber. So he's not the electrician or the plumber, but he has access to them. So in some cases, I sleep a lot uh, more, like a baby, but this doesn't scream every hour. I sleep very well knowing all of those problems are on a list, ready to call. Um, there's probably a longer list of things there. Uh, if you're turning your primary into a, a rental, uh, I, I 
have a long list of reasons why you don't put it in an LLC. A long list of reasons why. There's a couple of other things you have to know. If you're turning your primary into a rental, how long has it been your primary? Right. If you have an owner-occupied loan, sometimes they have a requirement that you live there for at least a year. Uh, I would... Um, I think I'll make a video on converting primary to rental because there's a lot there. And we are at the one hour and 11 minute point if you wanted to come back and rewatch the last five minutes of kind of that laundry list of things. So that was a great question. Thank you for that. I love it when a question says, hey, there is enough information here to want to put it in a teachable format. Cody Evers, howdy. The ORAT event is in Las Vegas at 50K. When is the Dion talk event? Um, <laughs> once a month here in Tacoma. Just fly here. We have the Tacoma FI meetup. So the ORAT event uh, is, I, we're, it's probably going to be the ORAT event because he's the one hitting 50,000 subscribers. It's a massive milestone. He's at 47,000 now. So at 50,000, he's going to start planning it. And he's also under contract on a house in Vegas right now. So Zuber's going to uh, do that. But the three amigos will be there. Millennial Mike will be there. So it's kind of going to be the group. Everyone will be there. I'm not sure about the Dion event. I've gone and presented it a few. Um, and it's a good question. So we'll have to let the thoughts out. Maybe I'll take a poll. Where would everyone go? I think we can all meet in Phuket, Thailand, and go do some scuba diving. Um, here we go. I lost where I was in the chat. Sorry. Here we go. Adam Calhoun. Jason, I have met with Jared from the Olson Group and really liked him. I liked him too when I met. We use this, them in the future, but this one is an off market deal that needs some repairs. Dude and Dave, I'm serious about the floor guy. I don't trust. Anything that's cold-blooded, like lizards, or my ex. I know I, I know exactly what my problem with my ex is. Both of them. All of them. They have terrible taste in men. Invest to wealth. Angel R. Howdy. Uh, Adam. If you being in Chicago, you should really set up an appointment with Jared. He'll take you around and show you some of the properties they have. That's what I would do. Definitely. Howdy, Cody. Rob, something is going on in my market. A lot of product above a million is starting to move, even though there is no way it cash flows. Speculation is back. Speculation is back. 1031s are back. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of... The, the market that I'm in, things are going just as fast as they ever were. It was expanding to the two new markets and really only finding deals because people weren't tracking what's going on with the rent. And now that I've closed... I'm sharing those markets. So if you live in the Pierce and Thurston counties in Washington state, you should start looking at Kitsap and Mason counties. And if you live in any other major area, maybe expand your market out and see what's going because remote working is impacting the entire country. Probably world, but definitely impacting the entire country. Redfin did an article and me and Zuber did a video on it on, on the One Rat Till at a Time channel. The 10 places the people are leaving the most, right? And, and so as predicted, San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Seattle. These are, there was like a long list of these 10 that they're leaving. Well, not a long list. It's a list of 10. Words are hard. But we followed it with the 10 places people are moving to. And it wasn't leaving California, going to Florida, leaving California, going to Texas. Like that was a factor, right? But the major 10 places people were going was San Diego, Oma, right? So to take the biggest city areas, highest cost of living areas, and it was an hour or two out because of the remote work thing. JMC, howdy. Love the content. Thank you. Keep producing. Quick question. How does the taxes work with your personal tax and real estate tax within your account? I know you despise LLC accounts. What is the process like? Kindergarten simple. That's the easiest way to say it. An LLC gets you zero tax benefits. There is no tax that you get, no break that you get for having an LLC. So you're right. I despise it. And that's not your question. So I'm going to step off the LLC soapbox. Um, every expense that is related to a property is a tax write-off. So 
um, let's see if I can, can I share this? Let's see if I can figure out the tech on this. I'm going to share a screen here if I get it to work. Okay. So this is a version of the property taxes that is uh, available for free in the binder course. So, and it's in numbers. There's also a version for Excel. This is from my CPA. So from left to right, payment, ACH, check, Venmo, cash app, credit card, the, the, the numbers for the card, however you paid for it over here on the left. So if you're audited, the auditor knows which documents to go check. This is why I don't need more than one bank account for each property is because they're, they're actually just going to look at the bank statement in the audit. The date that it was done. And the reason I want this is so that you can, I usually chronologize, chronologize it by date. The company is where you spent it. So Thurston County tax. Um, what is this? That's must've been some notes that I was put there. Um, who you pay, I think I was doing an example for somebody that I was doing an hour with, because you can also buy an hour of time at my Dean on Talk website. But uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, Floor Trader of Tacoma, the price and then the tax. You want the price and the tax separated out. The, the purpose for this is your tax is 100% write-off. It, it's a one-for-one one match. What you've paid in tax, you don't pay taxes on. The, the write-off of this will reduce your taxable income by the amount of the purchase, then where it's assigned to, and then a note. You want to put in the note because some things are amortized depreciation, scheduled depreciation, bonus depreciation, like all these things that I don't even want to know the definitions to. David and Dave could probably tell you because he works in the industry. And then rents. So I have, and I'll have to change this to 18 now, but the month that the rents came in, and really what the CPA cares about is over here, there's going to be the totals. So whatever that totals, and then I have water income here. So my taxes, this is it. This is all I deal with taxes. And then I have <laughs> a box of receipts. That's, that's how organized this needs to be. So I have a spreadsheet that shows income and expenses. The spreadsheet was designed between me and my CPA with the information that the CPA needs to do the taxes. It's kindergarten simple. I put the information together. I let the CPI pay them for that. It's like, I, I could go put a roof on one of my rentals, but I'm not going to. I will pay a pro to go do I pay the CPA for their knowledge, their training, their experience. And uh, depreciation is also factored in. The really cool thing with rentals uh, being, being income coming in is your depreciation and your write-offs usually makes it look like you lost money, which really helps when you go for the America Cares Affordability Cares Act, whatever the Obamacare medical stuff is, because uh, you have no income. But it makes you bankable because when lenders look at your income, they take the depreciation out of your debt-to-income ratio. It is almost like Congress is full of people who own properties and keep making laws and rules that benefit people who own properties. So weird. What are the odds? Michelle, man on the subject of saving money, just went to Nova Scotia for 10 days, realized my flights back were going to take 24 hours, so canceled, got $75 back and rebooked on AA miles for $62, got first class upgrade for free, nice, <laughs> gotta love it when that happens, 9,000 miles that I got from paying for everything on my rentals with that credit card. Yep, I, what's what I really like about Graham Stephan is he does the credit card churning for points, and if you're looking for that, that is that is awesome. Cody's going to Gen to Hawaii in January for free. There's one place I haven't been. I'm thinking, have I been to every state? There's some East Coast, Northern states I don't think I've seen, but I've been to most. I don't have any desire to go to Hawaii. I like to go to places where people like us. People in Hawaii do not like people from the mainland. Rob, Dion drops a comp bomb in his new market. That is... Probably how some people looked at it. Larry, they didn't answer my emails a year ago either, and I kept it moving. I wonder if people have a bad email. Because that's how the people that have reached out to me are trying to communicate too. Emails don't seem to be working. I'd probably just call. MJ, can you, hey Dion, can you post a link for the coded locks you use? 
I can. They will be in the comments below. I will pin a comment with the coded locks. Actually, I think the coded locks are in the description of this video. I think. The description here. Should be halfway down. Are they not there? Link to the rental at a time. Link to the locks I use. Yeah, it's in the description for this video. So here, I've got it right here. I will bring it up. If I can figure this out. Here you go. Pretty happy with them. Never had a tenant lock out. I might be trying some new ones at the new place on Lumberjack Landlord's recommendation. And then once I have tried them, I will give a review. I don't know if I like them yet or not. Uh, Dividend Dave showed my tenants the floor color and they loved it. They were worried I would choose a darker color. They are so silly. Nice. I have. This is the floor color. So for the tenant side, I'm doing LVP, of course. That's the color. I did like the light color here in Washington, too, because it can be so dark. Um, that's my sample of the ones that I've gotten ready. And then, of course, my chat move, Dave and Dave. Gas money for Thailand. That's about how much it will take, too. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Uh, Selling for locks, different Dave, show my tenants. Alantino, howdy. When are you releasing your book? Good question. First, I want to finish narrating One Rental at a Time's book and make sure I get that done for Mike. I'm probably going to handle the move, at least get the projects going. Um, and I and I'm I want to be really transparent. I am not writing a book. I I don't think it'll make any money. I'm writing a book because I want an instruction manual. It's going to read like like an IKEA put together a box book. Uh, step A, do these things. Step B, it's not going to be like one rental at a time. Is his story his 15 year journey to financial freedom? Um, is 15 conversations with real estate millionaires? Is is 15 interviews with people who reached financial freedom? Mine's going to be super boring. But when you go to screen a tenant, there will be a chapter you go to that has step by step by step. This is how I do it. When you go to find a contractor or a handyman, there's going to be a chapter. This is how I do that. So it's really just going to be instruction manual. So it's, it's pro it, it is a project I should start before the end of the year. Daniel, howdy. I was looking at a duplex. The seller had extended the lease for a new year at way below market rents. Would you still purchase to break even until your next year to then make a 10% ROI? So I had something very similar on a deal that probably would have done the same thing. I countered at a new number that made sense to me. Um, so I didn't get a response back on that, except that I had, I had a 400,000 offer accepted in a town called Shelton, Washington. I offered back 310. So they, they, they did the rents low. So here's how this works. The order of operations on a stupid seller. It's too long for a tile. But when you purchase it, you're figuring out your yield. That is your annual profit divided by your cost to acquire. So annual profit is what is left after principal interest taxes, insurance, and setting aside for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. So you, you factor that, and then you factor what the rents would be after the binder strategy, where they would need to be. And you go, okay, so if I'm going to make $500 a month, and then your cost to acquire, which is not just down payment. It's down payment, closing costs, and money for immediate repairs. So you have these expenses, and you can figure out your yield. Here's what changes when an owner does something stupid, like re-sign new leases at a low rent. It's going to lower your, your annual profit, right? But that's not where I put the, in the, that math in the equation. Let's say the rents could be $1,000, and they sign new leases at $500. Right, some nice kind of round numbers. You're losing $500 a month for the length of the lease. So if they sign a new year lease, that's 12 months. That's $500. So you take $6,000 per unit, add that to your cost to acquire. So if your cost was going to be $50,000 and you're buying a duplex, 
you now have $6,000 per unit. So that's a total of $12,000 that you're going to lose in rent that you could have got. Take that 12,000, add it to your cost to acquire, and now do your calculation. Would you still get the return that you wanted on that property? Pursue it. If not, where are you gonna put your price? What concession are you going to ask for since they did this lease change? So I think mine was, I offered four, had it accepted, found out about the leases, pulled back, offered 390, um, and then got my offer accepted on my other duplex and pulled back to 390. So I don't even know if they were going to take that or not. So yes, I would if the cost to acquire with the added loss in rents still got me the yield I was looking for. Thank you, Cody. Julie Anderson, have you done a living trust yet? No, because I don't like my kids. And that's not me, my problem, that's their problem. But I am going to be doing a living trust. That is the plan. Currently, it's just a will where each one of them inherits one third. Uh, unless they spend a penny on their mothers, then the other two get half. Uh, but I'm convincing them all that when I'm 78, I'm going to marry an 18-year-old and they're going to get it all. So I don't want my kids thinking their retirement relies on me dying, specifically because my kids would kill me for a piece of pizza. But good old times. Howdy. Thanks for the response. Watch all of your content and the Three Amigos content. Awesome. Thank you. Hopefully it's helping. Uh, Jason, 57 people watching, three likes, smash the like button. Every time you hit the like button, an angel retires before that. Give it a Dave. Let's go to Thailand. Exactly. Mark, financial firefighter. Aloha. Uh, we got Rob. They all came to San Diego and screwed up your comps. I missed. JMC, Dion, I appreciate the great response. Thank you very much. Currently at a barbecue, definitely coming back to rewatch. You're a legend. Have an awesome week. Thank you. Have a good time. Sad I wasn't invited to the barbecue, but that's okay. REI Stoners, howdy. Made it trying to go over inspection report with David. Nice. Yeah, I would. I would. I generally tend to look at the um, first couple of pages that are in red as the strongest part of the negotiation with the seller. It's the scariest verbiage things that you can use. Um, but I know David that you're talking to and I trust him. So I would really go off of what he's saying. Ned talks. Howdy. I was in Massachusetts for the weekend for a reunion. Delta offered me 800 bucks to wait for the next flight. My round trip cost me 950 and I gladly accepted it. Sadly, there was a no show and I had to fly. Ouch. Yeah, that's one of the really cool things about financial freedom, too, when you don't have a work schedule and you're sitting somewhere and you hear the PA go, hey, we'll offer you this if you'll wait. Why not? Sometimes it's worth it. REI Stoners, can you post a link to the motion sensor lights you use? They are in the description for this video right here. I will post it. Apparently, I don't do a good job of talking about the things that are in the comments below. That's for the lights. I did the locks too. I'm actually purchasing some for the, the place I'm going now. David and Dave, will you document your rehab journey? Will you grunt like Tim the Toolman Taylor? That's a great show. Uh, I'm definitely going to document. I might have missed a couple of before pictures. I've got a couple that look pretty good. Let me see if I, I don't, I don't think the image shows up very well when you show it on here. Uh, what it looks like right now. No, I don't think it'll show. I'll do some things, some shorts like the uh, the tool taking up the carpet strips. Can you see this from there, though? I don't think you can. That's the view out the front. So terrible place to live. That's the water right there. Um. Have you had to deal with trees growing into power lines? I have most of my life. Uh, my family runs tree services. You can call the utilities and, and sometimes they will come and cut them if they're in the power lines and they will look fairly ugly when they're done, but it's not a U expense at that point. Uh, sometimes when you call, they might require that you then cut them. But you can get several estimates. You can find tree trimmers on Thumbtack. So it's actually because I'm never touching a chainsaw again in my life for a tree. I might carve something. Or someone, but I'm not going to do any more tree work. I joined the Marine Corps because that's easier than tree work. 
but get several estimates like any other job. You can even get quotes now while you're under contract and just say, hey, look, I'm looking at having this done. How much would the expense be? <clears throat> Cody Evers, do you need an LLC for small business, laundromat, or car wash, for example? In most places, you're going to need at least an, uh, in a tax ID number. And so each state is different. I've had several LLCs. I was in an LLC with the truck driving school, my nonprofit, TPS that I used to wear the shirts for. Um, and I stopped wearing those because I felt like I was going to work. And the whole point was to not work. Um, I had LLCs for all of those. I just don't have an LLC for real estate because it doesn't give the benefits that most people expect. But if I was going to do a business, yeah, I'd probably do an LLC for any kind of small business that I was doing. And I think we have gone through all of the questions and I'm going to give it like another minute here in case there's any questions or people that were pending. Uh, every Tuesday, I do these live streams um, starting the Bigger Pockets boot camp this weekend. So that will be 10 weeks of Saturdays. Um, I have the course um, Zoom live stream is this Saturday at 12. I'm probably going to do a members only live stream looking at deals, uh, even though I am moving into my next house hack. I am also still looking for the next property. Uh, again, not because I want to grow the portfolio, but because the money builds up and you have to put it somewhere, which is the problem I'm trying to get all of you to. And uh, uh, Since there's a bit of a delay, I'm going to wait and probably wrap this up here unless there are any more questions. I think I have covered everything. For this week. If you came in late, the first, I want to say 10 to 15, but it was probably 20 minutes of this video was me explaining how it does take me about two hours a month to manage my 16 rentals. Because I did a short that was less than four seconds long, and it got over 5,000 views and a bunch of hate comments and a bunch of messages from people basically saying that that's not possible. And yes, it's not possible in the first year. You're learning the systems. That's going to take more than two hours a month. And growing a portfolio doesn't count in the management time of a portfolio. For me, the items you would have a property manager do is what I would count in those two hours. Hunting for deals, making offers, scheduling inspections to go and buy, that's growing a portfolio. That's not managing. But the managing part, if you treat your properties like you have 100 and your tenants like one, like you only have one, you are going to put systems in place that make this very but not easy, but as easy as you can to make you want to add more units. Okay. Thank you all for hanging out with me. It's been great. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk.